good evening, everybody. Uh, my, my name's Paul Webley. I'm the director of SAIS. It's a really great pleasure to welcome you to celebrate the inaugural event of the Southeast Asian Art Academic Programme. Now, just to make sure this is an enjoyable event, I do need to do a little bit of simple housekeeping at the beginning. So do please turn off your mobile phones. It's very embarrassing when a mobile phone goes off in the middle of a lecture. Uh, and do note where the fire exits are. There is no scheduled fire drill. The Southeast Asian Arts Academic Programme is an ambitious and exciting programme that's been funded by the generosity of the Alpha Wood Foundation. In a moment, we'll hear more about the Southeast Asian Art Academic Programme from Professor Gohapal Singh, who's Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities here at SOAS, and also Chair of the Project Board that's making this programme a reality. And one of the words we often use when we talk about SOAS is passion, or passionate, something I say a lot. We're passionate about our expertise, we're passionate about our specialisms. We try and inspire our students to be passionate. And it's the passion of one of the alumni of our postgraduate diploma in Asian art in the Department of History of Art and Archaeology, Fred Eichner, that's inspired this visionary enterprise. We're immensely fortunate to have Fred as a friend of SOAS, someone who's not only had a vision to make the world a more just and humane place, but through his Alphawood Foundation, who can, by working with partner organisations and institutions around the world, make this change a reality. We're truly privileged, I think, that he has chosen to work with SAIS on the Southeast Asian Art Academic Programme that's been funded by his donation, and a donation that's also allowed SAIS a state-of-the-art expansion through the redevelopment of the Senate House North Block, the building that's next door to this one. And I'm delighted that both Fred Eichner and Jim McDonough of Malfwood have travelled to Chicago to be with us tonight. I'd like to extend my personal thanks to Fred and to Jim for their friendship and for their inspiration. Thank you so much. After Professor Singh, we'll hear from Professor Anna Contadini, who's the incoming head of our School of Arts here at SAIS. Uh, Anna will introduce our esteemed speaker, Professor Hiram W. Woodward, and after the lecture, our speaker has kindly agreed to a brief question and answer session. That will be directed by Dr. Ashley Thompson. Dr. Thompson joins SAIS in September as the chair that's honoured by the name of our speaker, the Hiram W. Woodward Chair in Southeast Asian Art. Those of you who are academics will know how unusual this is. One of the things I love about this donation, this programme, is that it honours academics, academic work, academic development. So the fact that we have a Hiram W. Woodward chair, I think, is itself truly marvellous. Professor Contadini has curated a wonderful Arts of Southeast Asia and South South Collection exhibition in the Foyle Gallery. The exhibition constitutes a further stage in the Treasures of South project that's designed to highlight and showcase the many treasures that SAS has been given or acquired over nearly 100 years and to encourage research of those collections. The gallery will be open after the lecture, and I do urge you to see some of those objects in the exhibition, many of which uh, are being displayed for the first time. You'll have your own personal favourites. Rather, the one I rather liked was uh, there's a wonderful map of uh, Southeast Asia, which is actually from the Middle East. It's a superb piece, but you'll, you'll, there's also some wonderful objects there. It's a great exhibition. And I also hope you'll join us after the lecture for a reception upstairs in the Brunei suite. There'll be more music from our superb Indonesian gamelan players. So, without further ado from me, I'm going to hand over to Professor Gurhapal Singh, and he'll tell you more about the Southeast Asian Academic Art Programme. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you all for joining us to celebrate the inaugural event of the Southeast Asian Art, uh, Art Academic Programme, or as we like to say, SAP. Uh, this will be the first of many events in this transformational project that aims to create a real step change in the study, research, and understanding of Southeast Asian Buddhist and Hindu art. SOAS is world renowned for its study and research of South. Asia, uh, research of Asia, Africa, and Middle East, and has a long-standing link which this project will further strengthen. SARP brings new members of staff to the School of Arts who will join the wealth of talent that we already have in Asian arts. In, in September, we will welcome three fully endowed post holders to the Department of History of Art and Archaeology. 
In addition to Dr. Thompson, uh, Paul's uh, already mentioned, we'll welcome Dr. Christian Lukanets, who will take up the David Snellgrove Senior Lectureship in Tibetan and Buddhist Art. Dr. Lukanets, unfortunately, cannot be with us tonight. He is currently trekking in the Himalayas. We are delighted to welcome back also to SOAS one of our most esteemed former professors, David Snellgrove, who has kindly honored this post with his name. Lastly, I'm delighted to announce that Dr. Pritpal, uh, Pritipal, um, a recognized authority on the arts and cultures of the subcontinent, has honored us with his name of the Pritpal uh, Senior Lectureship in Curating and Museology. Dr. Paul cannot be with us tonight and sends his regards. Louise Thithcott, who will take up the post, is here with us. One of the main objectives of SARP is to bring students on fully funded scholarships from all over Southeast Asia to study it at SOAS. Beginning this September, over the next five years, we will welcome over 80 um, scholarship students. This year, we'll see the entry of the first cohort of students from eight different countries. They will study on the postgraduate diploma in Asian art, master's degree in the departments of Department of Art, History, and Archaeology, and Languages and Cultures. This year, we'll also see one PhD scholarship student, Heidi Tan, who is currently Deputy Director and Chief Curatorial Director of the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore. Heidi's research will focus on the museological behavior and Buddhist art, with a focus on the monastery collection of Myanmar. At the end of their studies, these Alpha Wood scholarships will return to the region with enhanced skills and expertise in heritage organizations to further develop the study and preservation of Buddhist and Hindu art and to make a long lasting impact in building capacity in the region. SAP will also increasingly involve it itself in outreach activity, building a network of organizations in the UK and Southeast Asia region to create an impact that, lo that is long after the life of the project itself. Before I finish, I want to thank those who have made this event possible. First, I echo Paul's appreciation of Alpha Wood for their truly inspirational and visionary initiative. I also want to thank all my colleagues in the Department of Art History and Archaeology, Languages and Cultures, and External Relations and Development. To Professor Tim Screech as head of School of Arts and Professor Anna Contadini as incoming head of School of Arts, and to all members of SAP, a warm thanks for their contribution in making this possible. Thanks are also due to Professor Anna Contadini and Farouk Yaya for all their hard work in producing the exhibition at such short notice. Thanks to our guests, Professor Hiram Woodward, for agreeing to, to give the talk today, and to Professor David Snellgrove, who has traveled from Turin to be with us tonight. I mustn't forget to mention that Professor Snellgrove is giving a lecture tomorrow on um, the Hindu and Buddhist sites of southern Sumatra that will be held in, this, uh, in the Brunei Gallery at 5.15 tomorrow evening. Lastly, we gratefully acknowledge the contribution of Paula Ferrer and Nick Gray for the music, for the Gremlin music that we heard earlier. I will now hand over to my colleague, Professor Anna Contadini, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Anna. Thank you, Gur Harpal. Good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to see many colleagues and guests and to see also so many students, past and present. Um, there is much work uh, and preparation behind events such as this, and I'd first like to thank Simone Green, the Southeast Asian Project Administrator, for all her hard work. Now, it is my honor and privilege to introduce Hiram Woodward, who, he tells me, likes to be called Woody. He's Emeritus Curator of Asian Art at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, where, for more than 20 years, 
he cared for uh, one of the world's greatest collections of Southeast Asian art outside Southeast Asia. He's one of the world's leading art historians of that region, and he's the author of numerous publications, of which I shall just mention two major items. His catalogue of the Alexander Griswold Collection, published in 1997, a groundbreaking study on the sacred sculpture of Thailand, and The Art and Architecture of Thailand, published by Brill in 2003, which is a fundamental reference work on the subject. Woodward's work is characterized by its probing examination of objects combined with comprehensive study of their contexts. And this approach has yielded a long series of discoveries and breakthrough interpretations demonstrating both intellectual flair and Im imaginative insight. After the lecture, a brief question and answer sessions with you, the audience, will be directed by Dr. Ashley Thompson. Uh, Dr. Thompson is herself a major scholar of Southeast Asian art, in particular of, of the arts of Cambodia. And I'm delighted to welcome her into the History of Art and Archaeology Department as the first Hiram Woodward Professor in Southeast Asian Art, beginning in September. And now, please join me in welcoming Hiram Woodward. I think I don't know what to do there. Uh, there we go. Thank you, Anna, for those very generous uh, words. And good evening, distinguished colleagues and guests. Prior to being tied to the School of Oriental and African Studies in this unexpected and undeserved manner, I suppose my closest connection with SOAS was through one of its American graduates, Henry Ginsburg, the late Henry Ginsburg, my friend and my wife's close friend for many years. Henry, who was keeper of the Thai language collection in the British Library and did so much to build up its holdings of Thai manuscripts, spoke with admiration of his teacher, E.H.S. Simmons. And prior to that, I can remember my senior friend, and teacher in Bangkok, Tant John, Prince John Chiriurachani, telling me that Peter B. of Zoaz had spoken the most elegant Thai of any foreigner. I have chosen to talk about H.G. Quarish Wales this evening because he gives us a lot to chew on. If you came here expecting that I was going to rehabilitate him, you will be disappointed. Most of us have encountered disparaging remarks of one sort or another. Craig Reynolds in 1995, his work is not taken very seriously today. Or Michel Jacques Ergouache telling us that Alastair Lamb in the years 1958 to 61 carried on archeological excavations in Malaya that interpreted in a more objective and scientific manner material that Quaritch Wales had examined somewhat rapidly and according to a number of a priori assumptions in 1936 to seven and 1940. And I think it would be fair to say that these days we encounter the name Quaritch Wales less and less. Maybe we should think of the dilemma of the Hollywood publicist. Aren't negative news stories better than no news stories at all? Of course, not all my judgments will be negative, and what I hope you will take away is awe of Quaritch Wales' prodigious output and admiration for his fearlessness in addressing issues of great importance, issues that academic timidity encourages us to sidestep. I will first give you a brief overview of his career, then I shall focus on two of his books, Siamese State Ceremonies of 1931 and The Making of Greater India, the first edition of which appeared in 1951. 
Horace Jeffrey Quaritch Wales was born in 1900 and attended Charter House in Queen's College, Cambridge. He was the grandson of Bernard Quaritch, founder in 1847 of the firm of that name, and Quaritch Wales maintained a connection to the booksellers until it was sold in 1971. In 1924, he went to Bangkok and became an English teacher at the Royal Page School, a school modeled on English public schools, which had been founded by King Watshirawut in 1910. At least that is what I was once told in Bangkok. Quaritch Wales' own description of his position was one of having, quote, an official connection with the Lord Chamberlain's department. The Royal Page School, was renamed Wajirawut College by King Prachatipok in 1926 in memory of his late brother. Whatever Quaritch Wales' exact position, it was his good fortune to observe at close hand many of the Brahmanical court ceremonies that punctuated the royal calendar. It is these experiences that led him to compose Siamese State Ceremonies, which was accepted by the School of Oriental and African Studies as a doctoral dissertation. Shortly after publication of Siamese State Ceremonies, Quaritch Wales appears to have turned to ethnography, and he published articles in the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute and in Man. Presumably, if he had moved into an academic position at this time, such work would have continued. Around the same time, he also pursued library research, producing a book on government administration in Old Siam. A much later work along similar lines is Ancient Southeast Asian Warfare, published in 1952. Then there was another shift in interest towards exploration and archaeology. Quaritch Wells was appointed field director of the Greater India Research Committee, which was funded in the first year by the Maharaja of Baroda, in the second by Mrs. Rentmore, who was Quaritch Wales' aunt. This made it possible to carry out field research in Siam in 1934, 1935, and 1936, and led to a number of publications, first in articles published in Indian Art and Letters, and then in a book intended for general readership towards Encore. Exactly how much of value is to be found in Quaritch Wales's unpublished field notes has not been definitively established. After Quaritch Wales's death in 1981, a large gift of his papers was presented to the Royal Asiatic Society. Recently, these were consulted by an, an American scholar interested in Pong Duk, a Dvaravadi period site in Western Thailand. Towards Encore is a wonderful book, still serviceable today as an introduction to Southeast Asia's past, because Quaritch Wales was not, on, not only provides an account of his travel adventures, but catches the reader up in, a, in his quest for understanding. If it were not for his errors of fact and judgment, it would be more frequently recommended. I suspect that George Sedes's Encore, the English translation of lectures Sedes given and gave in Hanoi in the early 1940s, owes much of its success to the fact that after reading towards Encore, Sedes realized that the discoveries of historians of ancient history could be presented in an intriguing and engaging way. The trans Peninsular route taken by Quaritch Wales ran from Takua Pa on the west coast of, to Chaya on the east. It was on this trip uh, that Quaritch Wales discovered the small Gupta style Indian stone Buddha now in John Guy's exhibition in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, on loan from the Bangkok National Museum. Of primary interest for Quaritch Wales was a small stone bas relief which I found in the roots of a tree when I was engaged in excavating the brick base of what had once been the central shrine of the city of Wiang Sa, in fact, the only building of which we had found any remains at the site. His opinion that it was in the purely Gupta style and might be dated to the fifth century has held up, but his assumption that it was probably bought, brought 
by Indian colonists would be questioned, as we cannot say whether it was brought by Indian colonists rather than traders or had been carried from India to the peninsula by local residents or even by Chinese traders or monks. Equally problematic if this small sculpture is considered as a demonstration of a Gupta wave of influence is whether there were in the fifth and sixth centuries sculptures in Southeast Asia that were influenced by it, as some scholars maintain, or whether, in a contrary view, later 17th century sculptures, later 7th century sculptures with Gupta-like qualities had, in fact, rather different sources. Many of Quaritch's whale speculations about C. Tep on the border between central and northeastern Thailand have not been laid to rest, and sometimes C. Tep is considered an enigma, as if archaeology and art history, if competently conducted, are not capable of sorting out his position in cultural history. In 1936, later wrote Quaritch Wales, shortly after returning from our expedition to C. Tep, I suggested that the Greater India Research Committee, the desirability of our turning our attention to the archaeological exploration of Malaya. The Asiatic, the published report, which appeared in the Journal of the Malayan Branch of the Royal Asiatic Society in 1940, with the title Archaeological Researches in Ancient Indian Colonization in Malaya, making use of the problematical term colonization, is a lengthy but concise account of the excavations of 30 distinct structures in Kedah in northwestern Malaya along the Thai border and a smaller number of sites in the contiguous state of Perak and in Johor, the southernmost province in Malaya. In 1941, Quaritch Wales joined the British Army and was assigned to Malaya. Excavations commenced again in Kedah and in Province Wellesley under the direction of Quaritch Wales's wife, Dorothy, and the report appeared in 1947. The wartime experiences led to the publication of a book of reportage and commentary Years of Blindness, published in 1943. I did not even know of the existence of this book until after I had informed Peter Sharrick that I would like to speak about Quaritch Wales, and I doubt that many people have read it recently. Just as in Towards Encore, Quaritch Wales demonstrates his fluency in telling anecdotes and expressing robust opinions. The theme of the book is the shifting relationship between East and West. The British officers and planters in Malaya, and to a large extent in India as well, have attitudes different from their 19th century predecessors. They have brought their wives, and so therefore have less direct contact with the native population. They can listen to the BBC and even telephone home. Asians with new ideas have been educated abroad, but only partially, and are not in a position to establish democracy. Quaritch Wales foresees the defeat of Japan, but not the hold that communism would have over many, over many in the post-war years. Many of the storage, stories Quaritch Wales tells are delightful, especially his recollections of traveling on coastal steamers, in one case as long ago as 1924 journeying between Bangkok and Saigon and stopping off in Cambodia. At one point, he devotes several pages to the physical and mental attributes of the Dutch archaeologist P.V. von Stein Kallenfels. The reader senses that von Stein Kallenfels was a kind of role model. Unlike the bookish and family-oriented Dutch officials Quaritch Wales meets at a club in Bandung, in vigor and curiosity, von Stein Kallenfels was a throwback to the great Dutch adventurers of the 17th century. In Java, wrote Quaritch Wales, von Stein Kallenfels was identified with Ravana, the demon king of Lanka in the Ramayana. In fact, Quaritch Wales appears to have gotten this slightly wrong. Von Stein Kallenfels was actually identified with Ravana's brother, 
Kumba Karna, who you see here on the left on the screen. <laughs> I shall return to years of blindness a little later, uh, pointing to passages that hint at the directions taken by Quaritch Wales in the years after the war. The post-war publications can be divided into four major groups. The first could be called meta-historical and begin with the making of Greater India in 1951. This was pre preceded by articles in the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society in 1946 and 1948, in which he presented his hypotheses in somewhat tentative form. I will be discussing the, greater, the making of Greater India later, but not the mountain of God, prehistory and religion, or the universe around them. In the second group, I have placed three titles, Angkor and Rome, the Indianization of China and Southeast Asia, and Early Burma, Old Siam. Early Burma, Old Siam is the only book by Quaritch Wales that I myself ever reviewed. This review in the Journal of Asian Studies seems to me now unduly harsh. I took Quaritch Wales to task for not exhibiting more aesthetic sympathy saying that most art in any one period tends to be mediocre and you should not condemn an, an entire culture as degenerate before first attempting to distinguish the good art from the ordinary. There was, I thought, a damned if you do and damned if you don't quality as Siam and Burma were portrayed as engaged in a race to the bottom. I fear I wrote nothing that would have made the author feel good. In the third group are two historical surveys, one about Dvaravadi, the other about the peninsula. Both are useful, but neither, when it was published, could be said to have broken new ground. In addition to this prolific output, Quaritch Wales also directed his attention to specific archaeological issues, resulting in short articles in the Journal of the Siam Society some reporting on fresh excavations. Quaritch Wales understood the importance of aerial photography in locating sites and analyzing settlement patterns, and his interest in procedures overlapped to a degree with those of Elizabeth Moore. Besides all of this, Quaritch Wales turned again to Brahmanical court ceremonies, and he wrote supplementary notes on Siamese state ceremonies. Much later, in 1992, Siamese state ceremonies was reissued by Curzon Press, incorporating the supplementary notes. Finally, one book was published two years following Quaritch Wales' death in 1981. It is an engaging and useful account of prognostication and astro astrology as found in Thai manuscripts such as a couple that are now on view in the exhibition in the Foyle Gallery. I cannot resist referring to a section from the introduction as it endows the present occasion with an element of symmetry. Quaritch Wales writes that in approximately 1931, in Bangkok, he had bought a copy of Proma Chat, Destiny in his translation, a do-it-yourself book of astrology containing transcriptions from various manuscripts. He says that it was 310 pages long. In 1980, 49 years later, he saw a book of the same title for sale in Bangkok, 800 pages long. Here is a jacket of my own copy of Promachat, bought also 49 years ago in 1965, and it has 648 pages. <laughs> I never met Quaritch Wales. There were just two occasions when I might have. The first would have been in 1964 when I visited the site of Muang Bon in the Khon Sawan province where some Dvaravadi period stupas were being uncovered. This was, in fact, a site that Quaritch Wales had first identified in the Williams Hunt aerial photographs and he initially requested permission from the Fine Arts Department of Thailand to excavate there himself. He did some exploring, apparently, and after his departure, the Fine Arts Department carried out a full-scale excavation. 
the young fine arts department officials I stayed with had previously accompanied Quaritch Wales. This was not a marriage made in heaven. And they had found him imperious. In the course of my visit, I removed bits of dried mud from the fragment of ornament you see in the uh, illustration on the screen. The second occasion was during my second long stay in Bangkok, probably in 1970 or 1971. My mentor, A.B. Griswold, whose Bangkok home was on the river on the Tonbury side, where a fancy hotel now stands, told me that Quaritch Wales had come to lunch and that they had gotten along like a house on fire. Somehow in the previous 25 years, they had never managed to meet. He was coming back again in a few days. Would I like to join them? My recollection is that I had recently read something by Quaritch Wales that I found particularly outrageous, and I doubted my ability to behave with the proper decorum. <laughs> Foolishly, I declined the invitation, a much regretted decision. About half of Siamese state ceremonies consists of introductory material and of descriptions of special occasions, such as the coronation, the tonsure ceremony, and royal cremations. The second half is devoted to ceremonies performed annually according to a fixed calendar. Quaritch Wales tells us that there are Thai accounts of these ceremonies the ceremonies of the 12 months, and he refers to the, mo to the two most important, the tale of Lady Nopamat and royal ceremonies of the 12 months by King Chulalongkorn. He uses these texts as source materials, but does not describe their literary qualities or attempt to define their function. Nang Nopamat was composed in about the second quarter of the 19th century by a palace lady but it purports to be a document dating from the Sukhothai period many centuries previously, and it is not clear how much of it may have been based upon an older text. It was the subject of a probing analysis by the contemporary historian Niti Iosi Wong, readable in Chris Baker's 2005 English translation. Dr. Niti's view is that Nang Nopamat was written as a guide to palace etiquette. King Chulalongkorn's much longer and more comprehensive book was written in the years before he died in 1910. In articles of my own, I have quoted a passage from the introduction, which goes as follows. Those who truly believed in Buddhism had no proper reason to hold the following of magical practices in respect. Later, however, those who followed Buddhism but had not attained the fruits of the path still experienced fear and terror on account of various dangers and concern for their own well-being and fortitude as the result of having previously worshipped and lived in fear of gods and divinities who had the power to punish both oneself and others for reasons that are not truly just by bringing about sickness or pain or of various sorts because of anger or hatred at not being paid homage or worshiped, or as the result of merely feeling evil, harmfully causing people trouble in the form of sickness or food shortages, among other things. Therefore, people decided to pay homage and to make offerings in order to prevent misunderstanding. King Chulalongkorn made a distinction akin to the proposal uh, by a number of 20th century anthropologists, including the late S.J. Tambaya, a distinction between reciprocal and non-reciprocal relations. Gods and spirits reward and punish us. Our relations with the Buddha are entirely one-sided. Everyone knows, for instance, that monks cannot acknowledge the food placed in their alms bowls. I wonder if the passage I have quoted provides some hint as to King Chulalongkorn's motivation in composing his long treatise. True, he was, a privileged, he was in a privileged position, knew more about these ceremonies than anyone else, and understood that many would fall into disuse 
as modern circumstances made them outdated. Therefore, he believed that they should be recorded for posterity. He also wanted to leave a record, presumably, that his successor could use as a guide. More than that, however, I wonder if there was not an element of superstition in the king's thinking. That is, when the jealous gods are no longer appeased, perhaps the very existence of such a text serves as a bulwark against their mischief. If this is the case, I would argue that the same holds for Nang Nang Pamat, the earlier treatise. Having readers and teaching palace etiquette is less important than the composition and preservation of a text that sets things right in our relationship with gods and spirits. I want to make an excursion into King Chulalong Khan's book, uh, uh, another part of his book, as it is something that has occupied me in the past few years as a result of trying, underst trying to understand an opening in a manuscript on the characteristics of elephants in the Walters Art Museum, dating from the 1810s or the 1820s. This manuscript opening is a summary illustration of a legend. The god Vishnu, at top center, responds to the pleas of two emissaries, left and right, and gives them a snake with which they are able to pacify a marauding elephant. This snake is also a lasso. In addition, it is the emblem of a powerful mantra. The figures at the bottom stand for humans to whom knowledge of the mantra has been passed down and who possess magical lassos, the snakes that encircle them. This legend was secretly reenacted in a ceremony of the fifth month, around April, the casting off and pulling in the rope ceremony. It is described in the ceremonies of the 12 months by King Chulalongkorn, but not in Siamese state ceremonies, where, however, a related fifth century ceremonies is briefly discussed, the sprinkling of elephants and horses. Following ceremonies performed by specialist Brahmins and by an elephant impersonator, the director or the deputy director of the elephant department, whoever is the more skillful dancer, takes the role of Vishnu at the time that Vishnu, writes King Chulalongkorn, changed his face into the face of an elephant, descended, and taught the knowledge of gacha karma, or elephant ritual, to the men at the time of the pacification of the marauding elephant. And an elaborate dance begins, accompanied by appropriate music and characterized by the assumption of various poses, including a rhythmic prostration and the repetition of certain sequences. The performer takes the rope of the lasso and dances with it, rhythmically extending it three times. Elements in this legend and in this ritual can be traced back to Angkor and the implications for our understanding of the role of magical powers in kingship are considerable. There is little doubt that the path of study initiated by Quaritch Wales will continue to yield significant discoveries. Occasionally, Quaritch Wales inserts his own presence into the pages of Siamese state ceremonies, and sometimes this might cause us to raise our eyebrows. In his chapter on the kingship, he lists various customs under 10 headings, which he calls taboos. He notes that ordinarily no one may touch the king, especially his head, yet while observation of this custom was mandatory in public, things were less stringent in private. At the conclusion of the coronation audience, he wrote, after the curtains have been drawn and the king is surrounded only by his pages and chamberlains, he permits his attendants to relieve him of his crown, and in, and in undoing the fastenings, they can scarcely avoid touching his head. This I particularly noticed on the occasion of the coronation audience of the present king, that is, King Prachatipok, 
when being in my official uniform of the Chamberlain's department, I was the only European present behind the curtain. At this, some people might be inclined to think, please be grateful for this experience, but shut up about it. <laughs> Siamese state ceremonies was never reviewed in the pages of the Journal of the Siam Society, but attention was conspicuously drawn to it in a talk by Prince Tani Niwat at the Siam Society in 1946, published in somewhat altered form in the journal of, in 1947 with the title, The Old Siamese Concept of the Monarchy. Prince Tani, born in 1885, was the leading spokesman of his generation for the values and culture of Old Siam. And his talk, given in the presence of the young King Ananda and his younger brother, Prince Pumipon, is sometimes understood as providing a rationale for the modern monarchy. Prince Tani referred to Quaritch Wales at both the beginning and the end of his published article. At the beginning, he quoted a, in full a passage from Bronislaw Malinowski that Quaritch Wales had also used concerning the essential role of tradition in traditional societies, especially when tradition is considered sacred. There's an element of confusion in this passage because Quaritch Wales has in fact misquoted, reversing the order of sentences and thus blurring the distinction between two different subjects. At any rate, Quaritch Wales's point was that some young Siamese didn't fully recognize the importance of tradition. He hoped his book would help serve as a guide to understanding which parts of these ceremonies should be maintained for the purposes of social integrity. Prince Tani had no intention of being taught anything by Quaritch Wales and wrote that he was inspired to speak about the monarchy on one hand because of Malinowski's views and on the other because of what he called a nationalistic impulse by which he meant, I think, not the nationalism of the government of the period but the native as opposed to the foreign point of view. Prince Tani addressed the role of, stressed, Prince Tani stressed the role of the king in protecting Buddhism and in the section headed, headed divine kingship, there is a single curt paragraph ending with the sentence, the average Siamese then as now has never taken seriously the idea of his king being connected with Hindu divinities, who after all had no place in his Buddhist faith." End quote. By attributing this opinion to the average Siamese, rather than presenting it as his own view, Prince Tani left questions a cunning historical sleuth would have to pursue. At any rate, he appears to be saying either that royal ceremonies should be demythologized or abandoned. He avoided engaging in any way with the treatise by King Chulalongkorn, who was a half-brother of his father. At the end of his article, Prince Tani more or less lost control of his reactions to Quaritch Wales's fourth chapter, the one <coughs> with the list of taboos. In part, this is simple indignation over the use of the word taboo, which Quaritch Wales probably used in order to sound anthropological, but which Prince Tani found condescending. Had the learned doctor been equally conversant with court etiquette in his own country, would he have written that it was also taboo in England to use the word of the common language or common modes of address? when speaking to or about the king and princes, when he noticed that one often said, your majesty, instead of you, that one preferred to talk of the king's natal day rather than birthday, and to say that the sovereign had been pleased to command his attendance upon the king at dinner, and so on. And then, a little later on, with all due respect to his wide reading and high erudition, which I can never claim to equal, there are, I feel, certain points, the significance of which requires no native, no effort for a native to understand. Well, let this be a warning to those who write about the cherished 
customs and beliefs of the living rather than of the dead. In general, I prefer to stick to the dead. <laughs> I will now take up the making of Greater India in its first edition of 1951. This book is a study of the character of art and architecture in classical Southeast Asia and the reasons for its variety, region by region. Quaritch Wales first distinguished a western zone consisting of Malaya, Thailand, and Burma from an eastern zone, Cambodia, Champa, Java. In the western zone, Indianization completely eradicated indigenous capabilities. In the eastern zone, a quality called local genius shaped creative developments in various ways, according to the character of the relevant prehistoric culture. A sentence from Towards Encore of 1937 shows that he was working his way towards the concept of local genius at that time. When the guiding hand of India, uh, it says in this book, was removed, uh, uh, her inspiration was not forgotten, but the Khmer genius was released to mold from it vast new conceptions of amazing vitality, different from, and hence not properly to be compared with, anything matured in a purely Indian environment. There are suggestions in Years of Blindness, published in 1943, that Quaritch Wales was interested in developing a grand explanatory scheme and was searching for the required methodological tools. For instance, he describes a visit in 1937 to the home in Malaya of H.D. Noon, a Cambridge anthropologist who studied the aboriginal populations, the Orang Asli. It is thought that Noon was murdered during the Japanese occupation by the lover of his wife, Temiar. A friend of Noon soon got used to the idea, Quaritch Wales wrote, of seeing a wild man from Borneo harmlessly coiled up on the veranda and raised no question as to the advisability of allowing a New Guinea headhunter to assist the Chinese cook in sharpening the carving knife. It was at H.D. Noon's uh, compound that Quaritch Wales first saw the great eight-armed Avalokiteshvar of the early 8th century, subsequently presented to the Perak Museum, now one of the treasures of the National Museum of Malaysia, and currently on view in exhibition in New York in the exhibition Lost Kingdoms. According to Quaritch Wales, uh, uh, and, uh, another point, at one time, it was the latest methods of filming natives that was engrossing to Noon's attention. At another, he was full of some new psychological means of studying the natives' most secret thoughts. This he had learned from an American anthropologist who, when passing through Malaya, had availed himself of Noon's ever-ready hospitality. Later, Quaritch Wales did intend did indeed look to American anthropology for insights into culture and personality. A stimulus of a different sort came from Japanese imperialist propaganda. In Years of Blindness, Quaritch Wales quotes from a translation of a pamphlet issued in Japan in February 1942. In the prehistoric age, mankind formed a single worldwide family system with the emperor at its head, and Japan was highly respected as the land of the parents, while all other lands were called lands of the children, or branch lands. The Japanese propaganda, Squarish Wales wrote, knew the mystic oriental mind and he sensed that Japan's pseudo-scientific theorists have actually crossed the paths of his own work, as he wrote. There was a possible response. Quote, an official greater Indian campaign of counter-propaganda could have been useful in two ways in the critical months that preceded Japan's bid for empire. 
In the first place, it might have served to shake the growing fascination of the peoples of Southeast Asia with Japan's meteoric rise by exposing the inconsistencies in Japanese claims and reminding the natives of their cultural connections with India, end quote. Greater India, therefore, was not a concept only applicable to the distant past. It had validity in the present, especially in the context of the Second World War. Quaritch Wales first presented his theories in a series of articles in the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society. In 1946, he described the successive waves of influence, Gupta, Pallava, and so on, a classification not considered particularly significant today because there was such constant contact between various parts of India and Southeast Asia. Waves that are today recognized, such as the spread of Mahayana images from Bengal in the last decades of the 8th century, were not successfully isolated by Quaritch Wales. He then went on to propose a Western and an Eastern zone. In the Western zone, which includes Thailand, there was initially imitation and then a lapse into decadence. The article, Cultural Change in Greater India, which appeared in 1948, introduced the term local genius and identified this genius with prehistoric cultures. At this point, Quaritch Wales was following in the wake of the Austrian prehistorian and ethnologist Robert Heine Geldern, who was born in 1885. Heine Geldern was a brilliant diffusionist, a scholar capable of linking up cultures across continents by the meticulous observation of unique details to be seen in artifacts of various sorts. Heine Geldern had worked out a proposed prehistory of Southeast Asia, built upon the clues provided by historical linguistics and a meager amount of archeological evidence. His work was published beginning in the 1920s, but his views concerning Southeast Asia are most easily accessible in an article published in 1966, two years before his death. His focus was on the non-Indianized cultures in Southeast Asia, and he believed that two distinct art styles or traditions could be identified. One, the monumental, the other, the ornamental. Just as a linguist constructs, reconstructs apparent language, Heine Geldern traced the monumental style back to what he called the older megalithic dating from Neolithic times and characterized by such culture traits as bull sacrifice, the erection of men here's, and feasts of merit. In fact, archeology span has not, to my knowledge, ever confirmed the existence of Heine Geldern's older megalithic. The ornamental style, on the other hand, had its origins in Dong Son culture of Northern Vietnam, best known from its bronze drums. Dong Son culture did spread into insular Southeast Asia around the end of the first millennium BC. For Heine Gelden, the ornament on a Toba Batok uh, house in Sumatra, such as on the right of the screen, could be in essence traced back to a Dong Son source, even though the physical evidence has entirely disappeared. Quarish Wales accepted Heine Geldern's reconstruction and took it one or perhaps two steps further. His question was, to which family did the art styles of the Indianized societies belong? The monumental, associated with the older megalithic, or the ornamental, associated with Dong Son? Cambodia, he decided, was to be linked to the older megalithic, Champa to Dong Son. How did this work in practice? At the time of culture contact, the process would appear to be fairly straightforward. The receptive society would take from India those elements that seemed compatible with the indigenous culture. But Quaritch Wales was not satisfied with just that. Here is where the concept of local genius comes in. The local genius shaped by the earlier prehistoric culture becomes subsequently a kind of guiding force. In his own words, it is the active agency which molds the borrowed material, giving it an original twist 
and at the same time preserving and emphasizing the distinctive character of the evolution. <clears throat> the historical origins of the concept, as Quaritch Wales himself acknowledges, are to be found in the writings of Dutch archeologists working in Java and maintaining that the differences between the art of central Java in the 8th and 9th centuries and East Java and Bali in the 10th to 15th centuries is to be explained by a process of Javanization, meaning that the art of East Java reveals more similarities to prehistoric culture than does that of central Java. I have always resisted this concept of Javanization, but for reasons a little different from what is at stake at the present moment. The use of the term for me has suggested that the art of central Java is not truly Javanese. That I cannot agree with. The two regions are equally Javanese, but in, in different ways. At any rate, Quaritch Wales writes, in East Java, once Indian control had been thrown off, the local genius was even freer than in Champa. And he quotes from a 1929 article from uh, Willem Studerheim, a Dutch archeologist working in the Dutch East Indies. In any event, the conception of the subconscious being are bound to conquer in the end. That which is indigenous is stronger than that which is alien, unquote. But Quaritch Wales pulls away from Studerheim's use of the term subconscious. He says it's better to substitute not being fully conscious, not being in full consciousness. Nevertheless, he does not convince us there that this is a meaningful distinction. In the course of the, of the making of Greater India, he just varies the terminology somewhat. Cambodia, he believes, had a type of religion and a form of cosmic symbol identified by Quaritch Wales as the God King or Devaraja concept that were, expression, were expressive of deep-rooted pre-Indian convictions working through the medium of local genius. And he also finds evidence of this Devaraja cult in East Java, which reappears in early form after had it long been repressed. Furthermore, no actual evidence for the pre-Indianized belief need be present. It may be inferred in the pyramidal structures of Cambodia, for instance, if they are not the result of some foreign loan, we should, I think, be justified in drawing the inference that the older megalithic genius was at work. Let's see how local genius is operating in Champa. Dong San art, well known both from ancient bronzes and modern survivals, shows a love of complicated spirals, circles linked by tangents, uh, meanders, etc., according to Quaritch Wales. For Quaritch Wales, this general characterization is sufficient. It is different from Heine Geldern's approach, which depended on the isolation of quite specific details. And here on the screen is an arch from the Cham site of Dong Zhuang from around 900 AD. Quaritch Wales wrote, the Cham tendency to put a carving, a curving or wave defect into the Indian decorative motifs can be seen as arches, pilasters, and friezes develop from the virtually Indian forms of the 8th century through the Wa Lai and Dong Zhuang styles of the 9th and early part of the 10th century, the latter being the style in which the local genius attains its greatest activity. The local genius, therefore, is a kind of force pushing the direction of the evolution in a certain direction. I suppose, genetically speaking, it would be considered a kind of reversion to a mean. Surely this process does posit the existence of some sort of culture-specific collective unconsciousness. Or un yes, unconscious. Most art historians, on the other hand, would want to analyze any particular development on the basis of specific visual experiences, whether of the most recent art, art of the past, or art of another country. 
In the case of the foliate leaves that hang from the stems in the Dong Zhuang ornament, we might see them as variation on the pendant leaves hanging from a necklace as on the Ganesha from Mison. Similar pendant leaves can be found in Javanese sculpture of the eighth century. The design of each leaf is varied a little as in the sort of mirror reversals we might expect in textile designs. It is interesting that in this case, where some observers might see a process of degeneration, Quaritch Wales finds the highest evidence of local genius at work. Surely, however, there is such a thing as cultural continuity. At this point, Quaritch Wales' citation of contemporary works by anthropologists and psychologists is only partially helpful. He refers to the Psychological Frontiers of Society, 1945, by Abram Cardiner. Cardiner was a psychiatrist at Columbia University who had actually been psychoanalyzed by Freud when he was young and who collaborated with members of the Columbia University Department of Anthropology in endeavoring how to understand collective culture traits and to think of cultures as having personalities. In general, the sort of analysis he proposes brings to mind the somewhat earlier attempts to characterize societies. Ruth Benedict's Patterns of Culture with its Apollonian and Dionysian tribes peoples, or Margaret Mead's studies of child rearing practices in Bali. Among the culture traits Cardiner believed should be analyzed are induction of affectivity, solicitation of response, handling, play, fondling, but preferences for ornamental or uh, preferences for monumental or ornamental art styles don't make it onto his list. So we are left with the problem of whether, if we maintain that cultures are organic entities, it is possible that known cultural traits, suppose 95% of the totality of cultural traits, can generate a missing 5%, this 5% being the art styles. Or more optimistically, if the induction of affectivity is constant, generation to generation, the character of the art shouldn't change much either. This brings to mind E.H. Gomprick's lecture in search of cultural history and the ridicule he directed to Adolf Loos's contention that given a single doorknob, he could reconstruct an entire civilization. In the Western zone, which includes Thailand, extreme acculturation took place. There was an initial Indianization that was so severe that, local, that the local genius was entirely wiped out. Only degeneration was possible. In this context, Quaritch Wales later discussed that in regard to the ornament in Dvaravadi Wheels of the Law, which appears to have become increasingly schematic, in the course of the seventh and eighth centuries, the point could equally well be made <clears throat> on the basis of sculpture in terracotta and stucco, where similarly robust, complicated, three-dimensional coiffures and necklaces are turned into something simpler, flatter, and more based on incision as we move from the seventh into the eighth century, though not all scholars are in agreement concerning these datings. Here we have another set of challenges. Is it possible that the initial adoption was so overwhelming that an entire population was turned into zombies? If not, what other kinds of explanation should be provided? Should we put the blame on a narrow group of hidebound patrons who discouraged creativity and absolved the population as a whole? Or should we avoid any attempt at explanation? George Sedes wrote a rather positive review of the making of Greater India, which was published in English in the journal Diogenes. This is ca his characterization of Quaritch Wales's position. Without saying so in so many words, he seems to look on the pre-Indian civilizations of Southeast Asians as venerable trees in which the Indian graft had provoked the flowering of the Javanese, Khmer, and other civilizations. To this, 
Sides contrasted his own view. My impression, but it is only an impression, is that the ancient pre-Indian civilizations of Indochina and Indonesia, whatever the label one cares to put on them, have provided the more or less rich, more or less complex soil in which some plant of foreign stock has grown. And then that whatever country one looks at, the plant is the same and displays only such differences as are due to the differences of soil. Was the Indian tree planted roots and all, Sides' view, or was it only grafted onto a native tree, the view attributed to Quaritch Wales? Today, if we have students who want to know the answer to this question, we are likely to send them first to the work of another scholar with deep ties to the School of Oriental and African Studies, Oliver Walters. And in history, culture, and region in Southeast Asian perspectives, after making our way through hundreds of footnotes and 148 pages of additional nuances in appendix after appendix and postscript after postscript, we, we will be prepared to discuss the issues knowledgeably, but will surely feel somewhat nostalgic for the days of Quaritch Wales's bold propositions. <laughs>